Good morning, everyone. We're continuing today with our series on the Lord's Prayer, and we've come up to the third and last petition that's part of this prayer. And you ever have one of those nights when you just can't, you, you wake up and you can't get back to sleep? I woke up at 2 o'clock this morning, and at 3 o'clock I was sitting in the kitchen writing some more. My wife was at her mom's for, uh, for taking care of her for the weekend, and so I, I, I figured God was telling me to get up and write some more. And so at 3 o'clock in the morning, I was sitting in the kitchen writing. Uh, so <laughs> it's one of those days, and what, but it, it's a good day. So we've reached the last petition, and it can actually be viewed as two petitions. The, the, the whole petition is, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And we can break that down into two petitions, lead us not into temptation, and then deliver us from the evil one. And whenever we recite this prayer, whether it be here in the sanctuary or at home, a proverbial 1,000-pound elephant walks in the door. And we need to talk about that metaphoric elephant by addressing the notion that God leads us into temptation. Because... God does not lead us into temptation, nor does he tempt us. God created us. He loves us. He directs us. He cares for us. He corrects us. And he rebukes us. But he does not lead us into temptation. Last week, Michael read verses 9 through 12. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Then he asked an interesting question. Michael asked, why are we asking God to do things he already does? And why are we telling him things about himself he already knows? Michael's answer was that the prayer doesn't change God. Prayer changes us. It makes us cooperate with the purposes of God. The first part of verse 13, and lead us not into temptation, begs the opposite question. Why are we asking God to not do what he doesn't do in the first place? Why are we asking God to not lead us into temptation when we know that he doesn't do that at all? My thought is this, that God will never lead us into temptation. He knows it, and this petition is forcing us to acknowledge the fact so that we can change and cooperate with God's purposes, just as Michael had said last week. Now, we do a very good job of allowing ourselves to be tempted. And by acknowledging that God does not tempt us, what we're actually doing is asking God to help us and others Avoid going down that road that leads to temptation. James, the brother of Jesus, cautions us in James chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. When tempted, no one should say that God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. What James is saying is that temptation starts with us. We should consider it an inside job. We must realize that we have within, our, within us, within our hearts, within our head, the ability to be drawn away from God by our wrong or misplaced desires. As sinners... We're always battling temptations, whether it is the temptation to overeat, to look lustfully at someone, to insult another, to strike another, to skip out on attending worship. Whatever the temptation, don't blame God. He's not the cause of the temptation. And in addition to not blaming God, we should never be tempted to blame anyone else we are the cause of our temptations. Blaming someone else 
for our temptations is a nasty little habit that's been handed down from our very first parents, Adam and Eve. In Genesis, after the woman was enticed to eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God commanded them not to do, and God confronted them, does anyone remember what Adam said? Hmm? Adam said this, the woman you put here with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate it. That's what he said. With those words, Adam started the blame game. First, he blamed God for putting the woman with him. She was God's creation, and Adam had nothing to do with it. And then he blamed the woman for giving him the fruit. Then the woman blamed the serpent for deceiving her. And all of this happened before the woman even had a name. Not only was blame created, but what was also created was a person's failure to take responsibility for his or her actions. Those two items are thriving quite well in millions of people around the world today, Christians included. Fortunately, God created accountability. A petition similar to lead us not into temptation is offered by King David in Psalm 141, verse 4. Incline not my heart to any evil thing to practice wicked works with men that work iniquity. What's interesting is that David wrote those words long before his eyes fell upon Bathsheba. And we all know that David became the equivalent of the biblical poster boy for temptation. David had a heart for God, and God looked favorably upon David. David's actions tell us that even those with hearts for God and who God looks upon favorably are not immune to temptation and sin. If we're going to pray and lead us not into temptation and ask God for help, help to avoid us going down the road that leads to temptation, and since temptation is an inside job, it starts with us, we need to determine what we have going on that's causing us to be tempted. When we prepare for communion each Sunday, an elder will read these words. The Apostle Paul directs us to examine our hearts before we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And we examine our hearts and confess our sins so that we can approach the table in a worthy manner. In the same way, we need to examine our hearts and give up to God that which is push it, pushing us towards temptation and sin. Are we in a toxic relationship with someone? Are we surrounded by people who tell us nothing but lies? Do we participate in gossip? Have we not forgiven our debtors? Michael spoke so passionately about that last week. We're all sinners. And I'm sure our lists can go on and on. This prayer does not change God. This prayer must change us. Temptations ought to be prayed against because of the discomfort and the trouble they cause, because of the danger we are in of being overcome by them, and because of the guilt and the grief that follows. While God will not tempt us, one thing that God will do is allow us to be tested. God will allow us to go through trials that may expose us to Satan's assaults, as in the case of Job. And we all know what Job went through. And at one point, Job did blame God, but not in a sinful way. He didn't reject God or hate him 
but was speaking out of the anguish of his soul because Job was feeling like what he was enduring was unjust. He had done everything in his power to live a righteous life, and he was expressing his frustration and grief before God. He wanted to know why he was enduring such suffering if he had lived such a good life. God's response to all this was, you are not God, and you do not understand my purpose and my ways. I've also heard it said this way, because I'm God and you're not. Job was humbled before God in a big way, and his response to God was, Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job took responsibility for all of his words against God. And God forgave him because the end of Job says, the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. Hopefully, by the grace of God, the trials we face will not be as severe as Job's. The petition of lead us not into temptation expresses our desire to avoid the dangers of sin altogether. God knows what we need before we ask. And he promises that no one will be subjected to testing beyond what we can endure. He also promises a way of escape, often through endurance. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. And in his greetings, James encourages Christians everywhere to consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your, of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The second part of the petition, but deliver us from the evil one, falls directly under Michael's question. Why are we asking God to do things he already does? When we gave our hearts to Jesus and asked him to be our Lord and Savior, we were delivered from the evil one. Jesus paid our sin invoice that Michael had attached up to the cross last week. But that will not stop Satan from trying to weaken our faith or reject God. If we didn't have Jesus in our lives, we would be ignored by Satan. It's because of our relationship with Jesus that he attacks us. And Jesus teaches us to pray, asking God to deliver us from Satan's power, from his snares and his temptations. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, the Apostle Peter warns us that Satan prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. And in John 10.10, 10, Jesus also warns us that Satan's purpose is to steal and to kill and to destroy us. He wants to destroy our marriages, our families, our church, our health, our relationship with God, and our relationship with others. We always need to be alert and pray for God's protection. Satan oft often uses the trials in our lives to tempt us to sin by doubting God's love and his faithfulness. 
That's why a trial or a problem can make us a better person or a bitter person. If we trust in the love of our Heavenly Father, it makes us better, and it does grow us spiritually. But if we fall into Satan's temptation, we can, come, we can become bitter and often disappointed with God. For example, if we didn't get that job that we were hoping for, do we see it as a chance to pray more and to seek God's will? Or will we fall into Satan's trap and be impatient, disappointed, and angry with God? Failure can teach us to be more humble, careful, and rely more on God. But Satan can use it to discourage us and make us frustrated and give up. And the petition, deliver us from the evil one, is also a prayer for protection, and God provides that for us. In Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2, we read, But now this is what the Lord says, He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. The promise of Jesus to never leave us or forsake us will never be broken. And in addition to prayer, the best defense we have from temptation is the Word of God. Jesus proved that when he was being tempted by Satan. Satan first said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Satan then said, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is, it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And finally, after showing Jesus the kingdoms of the world and their splendor, he said, All this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus responded, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Satan knew scripture, but he was no match for Jesus who, as God the Father, breathed life into every word in the Bible. We need to use the entire Bible as our defense, and not just those parts that make us feel good. If we're going to walk around and repeat with gusto Paul's words from Philippians 4.13, I can do all this through him who gives me strength, then we must also live by the words that Jesus told the woman who was caught in adultery. Go now and live your li lead, leave your life of sin. This is what Martin Luther writes in his small catechism about verse 13. God tempts no one. We pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil the world, and our sinful nature may not deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. Although we are attacked by these things, we pray that we may finally overcome them and win the victory. He concludes his writing by saying, We pray in this petition, in summary, that our Father in heaven would rescue us from every evil body and soul, possessions and reputation, and finally, when our last hour comes, gives us a blessed end and graciously takes us from this valley of sorrow to himself in heaven. The 
three petitions within this prayer. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Along with all the acknowledgments about God that the prayer contains are all that we need for daily living. That's why it's so important to pray all of these words in the Lord's Prayer every day. Because as we bless Him, He will bless us. And perhaps, maybe Jesus worded this prayer in such a way that we would ask questions. We would ask, why are we asking God to do things He already does? And why are we asking God not to do something that He doesn't do anyway? Maybe the simple answer is that so we understand that we need to depend more and more upon God each and every day and less and less upon ourselves. Maybe that's why these words are called the Lord's Prayer and not the people's prayer. Because this prayer is all about God and it's not about us whatsoever. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for being our God who knows us completely. You know our thoughts before they occur. and You know our words before they're spoken. Thank you for allowing us to ask you to provide for our daily needs even though you would give them to us anyway. Thank you for forgiving our sins yet still require that we confess them to you. Thank you for leading us away from temptation even when we start going down that road. Father, help us to allow more of what you desire for us and less of we desi- what we desire for ourselves. Not our will be done, Lord, but your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.